So the great weather returned, uh, the storms have passed, a lot of damage. Uh, we set records for a week, a week's rain, a EU record for a week's rain here. I'm absolutely torrential. And uh, going down the beach um, yesterday, the, all these uh, animals that really came down from the mountains, they were washed down in rivers and then washed onto the beach. Um, the, the rivers were running t just in torrents. There's a, a bridge that came down right on the evening news, um, right as it was being filmed, uh, an ancient bridge. So, yeah, we've been kind of living the apocalypse here. And um, I, get, I gather, from, I have a disproportionate amount of, the few viewers I have, I have a disproportionate amount of uh, Australian viewers. And I think that's possibly because like here in Greece, uh, I think people are kind of living the apocalypse already. In America, I think people are, it's kind of a winter wonderland and although they got extreme weather, it doesn't quite feel like uh, climate change in Armageddon yet. But in Australia, I think with the uh, fruit bats, uh, the die-off of those and then the Murray-Darling Basin, uh, there's a big fish die-off um, and then their record temperatures being set uh, in, in many cities. So I think that my experience here is resonating a lot more um, with Australians at the moment. I imagine that in August uh, it, it'll probably reverse and probably Americans will start to be a little bit scared and a little bit more panic and my viewership will probably double from about 10 people to 20 maybe in, uh, in August. But anyway, this video is a request um, from Big Gav and uh, the Going South Tribe in Australia. And I'm more than happy to do this video. What he, what he was asking for is to just go over my uh, epiphany moment when I realized it's too late for digital democracy. All these things are, are too slow for abrupt and imminent uh, climate change catastrophe, really, is what we should be calling it. Yeah, so, so this video is, is more than a joy for me to do because uh, it's been a really lonely journey uh, for me the last five or six years. Um, and I would love to share it with you because I've really shared a lot more on public videos than I have with the people around me and even family. Um, they're just not ready to hear it. Um, and so I've been wrestling with, with this for, for a long time. Um, I've sort of been traveling in the path of uh, uh, Guy McPherson, although he been much longer on this road than me. Um, so, you know, I think he was in 2002 where I kind of got to in 2013. But anyway, so my, uh, my epiphany, uh, and, and anyway, yeah, this is really cathartic for me to actually spill my story. So, yeah, might be a little long-winded, but ah, it's therapy for me. So, yeah, um, I think maybe you'll find it interesting too. It uh, seems to be a kind of fascinating journey f from my point of view. But then I'm not sure how it comes across uh, to, to an audience. So, anyway... Uh, my big epiphany, I think, I think it's what Guy, Guy Lane calls the eco-epiphany. Uh, basically the moment when you realize that we really are all screwed, we don't get out of this one. And that, that really happened in December um, 2018, so it's the 1st of March 2019 today, so it's you know, just a few months ago. Uh, and yeah, I, there really were two eco-epiphanies I had. The first one was around 2012-2013. And the reason for that one was I was I've been watching the climate science since since the the early 90s. Um, you know I was commuting in London, and I had a two-hour commute each side of the day. So I had about two hours to sit on a train and read. And I read New Scientist and um, uh, subscribed to Nature and that kind of thing. And read these scientific journals on things like climate change. And so I've been watching the progress of the story from the scientist's perspective, reading, reading occasional uh, papers, scientific papers on, on it. Um, but increasingly, I was starting to see a pattern. So now I'm a computer programmer, and so I can second guess you know, what they're doing. 
And what I saw increasingly happening as each IPCC report comes out is I can see that the models are too linear. So they keep on chasing where the data is. And you can see graph after graph where they adjust their model slightly and then it's much worse than they think. And they adjust their model slightly and it's much worse than they think. And I'm looking at this, I'm a computer programmer, I've done a lot of modeling of these kind of things, as I mentioned, and I'm starting to see this pattern. I'm saying like, it's going exponential. It's going exponential. Can't you see? There must be feedback loops. And nobody's really seeing this. Um, and then uh, I can, I, you know, read Gladwell's tipping point and all of that. And so I'm ready for all of these tipping points and starting to wonder if we haven't passed the point of no return in a, in a number, of, number of ways. Um, by about 2012, 2013, I really thought, okay, I've, I know exactly what they're doing. They haven't got the fact that it's uh, a, a real big positive feedback loop, probably coupled with a, a few feedback loops. And I don't think they're hiding it. They're doing what a lot of physicists um, and modelers do. And that's, I've seen uh, and had enough involvement with them to know that there's this kind of pattern where if you have to publish, uh, there is a kind of Overton window of what you can actually legitimately publish in a scientific paper. And, you know, so they, it's kind of their Overton window. So what physicists are very used to doing this and mathematicians too is you routinely run calculations and formulas and they run off to infinity, either positive or negative. And then you just go, ah, okay, well, that's, that's a pathological case. So you just put it aside. And I realized climatologists were doing exactly the same thing. They come, they must have run models that just run off to, to infinity quickly. And to a climate scientist, that's a career ending move to put a paper out like that. You're basically saying, oh guys, uh, you know, according to my model, this runs off to infinity and by 2030, we all baked. And then, you know, all the established PhD psychopaths would come and, and, you know, say, oh, that's a rookie mistake. You've, you know, your model runs off to infinity. You've got to go and tweak it. So anybody that's a graduate student level would know that you take those cases and you throw them out and you keep on running the cases till it, you know, has some kind of form that kind of is politically correct. And then you can publish a paper because it has some new and interesting result. But any result other than, hey, guys, this runs off to catastrophe. So I'm seeing this pattern and I can see what, what they're doing and, and I can guess why. Um, it, by the way, this is also, I mentioned Apollo 13 the other day. This is some, this, there's this inability to see the uh, see catastrophe that, you know, it's kind of natural that people can't do it. But in Apollo 13, they actually had a scenario. They, they trained for every possible disaster scenario they had. And then you say, well, why didn't they train for the one in Apollo 13? Well, it actually did come up. It came up in the training. And the reason they didn't train for it was very interesting. They just said, no, this is uh, such a disaster scenario, it can't happen. Now, note that very carefully. They didn't say, this is not worth training for. If we had a disaster like that, there's no remedy. We there's nothing we could do, so it's not worth training for. They said, it's such a disaster, it can't happen. It's kind of, it's unthinkable because it's so bad, therefore it won't happen. And that's pretty much what the scientists were doing and, and, and still, still are doing. So all of this, I started to realize that, you know, this climate change is happening now. You can see it. You could see it clearly by 2012, 2013. And I, uh, okay, I'm a complete nobody. And I, so, you know, the impetus is to run around telling people, guys, this is fucking serious. This is really, really bad. And, you know, I couldn't make any headway. If I try to talk to people, you know, if you talk to friends, because I have no credibility, no credentials, nothing like that, then, you know, you talk to people, they would either just spout back some bullshit they just regurgitated from CNN or the mainstream media, uh, or, oh, you know, it's solar cycles, blah, 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 yeah, and it's all this bullshit. And then, you know, and then the few people that would listen, they would have a reaction like, you know, well, 
if they're kind of hostile, then they would say, you know, oh, so if you're so much smarter than all the scientists, why aren't you on CNN then, you know, telling the world about this? And, you know, and even people that did get it, then they'd go, yeah, I get it and we agree, but what can we do? We all screwed. And so uh, really it's, I think a lot of people who have been in my position and are in my position right now. Um, so I was desperate to do something and get the message out. So a lot of people would say, oh, write a book about it. But the problem is that it's an incredibly noisy environment. There's so much, the signal to noise ratio is, is abysmal. Uh, there's, you know, all these huge corporations just fighting for a tiny slice of people's attention and eyeballs. Uh, there's no way you can get a message out, a particularly apocalyptic message that nobody wants to listen to. And this is what Guy McPherson has been living through for decades now. I really sympathize with him a lot. And uh, yeah, have, have huge admiration for him. That just that he's managed to hold on to his sanity so long, um, which I can't promise I've managed. Uh, so anyway, this is the situation. You, it, it, this is what it feels like. It feels like, you know, you're in a crowded beach. There's everybody shouting and performing and carrying on. And the sea has just suddenly gone out about five miles, suddenly re retreated five miles dramatically. And everybody goes, hey, look, there are all these free fish down on the, you know, on the seabed. And they all run onto the seabed collecting all these fish and going nuts and having a big party. And, you know, you're standing on the shoreline going, guys, it's a tsunami. It's a tsunami. Get out of the fucking way. Head for higher ground. And no one's listening. They're all picking up fish. And, you know, you, know, you try and tug on somebody's coattails and say, yeah, yeah tsunami. <laughs> you know, what do you know? Look, at, I go, look, check at this fish. And you just cannot make any headway with all this, you know, manic white noise. You just can't get a message out into it. Now, you might think, uh, well, yeah, well, why don't you just head for higher ground yourself and, you know, screw them. But, see, I'm an older guy. I'm, a, I'm 53. And, you know, my kids are in this crowd that's going nuts. And, you know, all the people I know and love, it's not big on my agenda to save my own skin at the expense of everybody else. I would much rather just try and get two or three people, whatever I could, to higher ground if, you know, you know there's a tsunami and no one else does. Um, but I couldn't even do that. So it seems absolutely hopeless. But, uh, yeah, I've, I've got an interesting background. And so, and so it didn't seem hopeless to me because there is a way of getting a message out. Uh, so the, the way it's not quite like you think. In a white noise environment, you can get a message out because... It's not a completely random environment. Our environment now looks completely saturated with everybody's messages and advertising and political angles and everybody's got their angle. They're all fighting for attention in the media and it seems like it's a completely white noise, unstructured environment. It's not. It actually has structure. So if it has structure, there's a lot of hope for getting the message out. And so what I knew from network theory is that the structure of this madhouse environment we've got is actually a scale-free network. So what's a scale-free network? Well, if you, a, an example, a good example to explain it is one that some people give is they just say you get a pile of, of paper clips, just put them all in a pile on a desk and pick one out at random. Then pick another one out and couple those two together, drop them back in the pile. Then pick another two out, couple them together and drop them back in the pile. And you keep on doing that iteratively. Eventually some will have been already connected and they'll get longer and longer. And what you're building, you eventually find that you have what's called a scale-free network. What does that mean? It means that some of these paper clips will be preferentially connected. And it will be on a Pareto distribution. That means an 80-20 rule. So it'd be like 20% of the paper clips you'll eventually find will have 80% of the connections. So, you, it's not a question of getting the message out to everybody, like it seems at first, just shouting over the crowd, Tsunami, get out of the water! It's really a question of finding the preferential nodes and getting a signal through to them. That's quite a doable task. So if you, I read up on papers on network theory and found, well, 
On a scale-free network, you only need to own about 5% of the nodes at random, which is a surprising result. You just pick five of the paper clips at random and you will, in, in that, have a very high probability of having enough nodes to control the whole network. So that means you can put a message out with controlling five networks at random. Not, not the key ones even. You don't even have to find the pressure. You don't have to you know, take control of the Wall Street Journal or like Bezos and these guys think. You can actually just take 5% you know, of the population on the street, almost. And you can propagate a message through them. Now, I realized reading that paper that the, because it's a scale-free network, I realized something that the guys that did the paper didn't realize, and that's, well, it's scale-free so that you take those 5%, you can do it again. You can take 5% of that, and you can control those. You can control that to control the 5% and keep propagating outwards. That was something that they missed in that paper. Now, you might think, well, how small can you go? Eventually, you're going to get to, to one node, and then you just back to being the guy in the crowd shouting tsunami and you, you haven't got anywhere. Well, it's, it's not quite like that. Getting a message out in a crowded room is, you have to think of it more. I'll give you another analogy. Imagine you're in a disco and it's, uh, you know, mammoth one with lots of rooms and there are lots of DJs playing different things in different sections and there are people going nuts and getting drunk and there's you know pyrotechnics here and lights here and it seems like an impossible mess uh, it seems like impossible to get out the message to people say guys there's a fire we need to get out you know you try and put that message out and the guy says oh yeah come on baby light my fire and you're like uh, yeah he said have another drink dude and say like lighten up and you know you get all of this kind of negative feedback from putting out a message that's a really serious one fire we need to get out of here um, but, you know, it could drive you mad trying to get a message out like that, unless you actually know some of the theory. And, so, and here's another piece of the theory. So in that kind of environment, when you pick the nodes, you can take a bet. And that's kind of what, what I was doing is, it's very unlikely you're the only person out of 10,000 that knows that, the th that the, uh, this disco is on fire. Uh, so, you know, this, the club is about to burn down, it's going to be a disaster. Uh, it's very likely that there'll be other people that, amongst the crowd, are doing exactly what you're doing. They know there's a fire and they're trying to warn people and that they're not being successful. So really all you have to do is hook up with those people. You can do it almost by line of sight. You know, so imagine this. You're in the club, masses of noise, you just have to scan it for people that have got the fact that, that the place is on fire you'll soon pick up, say, Alice over there and Bob over there. And because they are tuned in to the wavelength that the, there's an emergency, you can get eye contact with them. And you can say, Alice, you got it. Fire. Yeah, yeah. Bob, fire. You got it. Okay, okay. Stick with me. This is what we do, right? You can do all of this by hand gestures across a crowded room. And you'd say, like, okay, you know, pick up this drumstick or pick up something that you could beat with and you got it. Okay, you ready? On my count, one, two, three, boom. Okay, again, one, two, three, boom. And then all three of you can basically do this signal. And if you start getting a rhythm going like that, that counts in communication uh, theory as a signal. Very soon, you'll be able to recruit people onto that signal. So you can say, you know, the person next to you say, when it's going boom, you know, boom, boom. And then basically you can say, to the person next to you, really, come, on, you know, come in with me, you know, and then all people, it, very quickly, you could grow that drum beat until eventually you go, boom, and you say, fire, fire, get out now, emergency, or whatever, you can pass that message once you've established a network. I think I, hopefully I've communicated to you how it works and how you can actually send a signal in just a complete random white noise environment. So, by 2013, I didn't think this was really a bad thing. I mean, I would, okay, I'll call this one, that my good uh, eco epiphany was in 2013. And it might sound strange that it's good. But you see, if you look at say, people like Jim Bendel and, uh, you know, his, his uh, deep adaptation, which is getting a lot of play, and there's a video of him giving a talk in Bristol. And 
everybody is going into shock and stuff because they're having confirmed what they can't know at the back of their mind and, and they're saying that yes our civilization is finished was well okay it's not our civilization it's our species but anyway I was thinking in 2013 the same thing I was having that kind of revelation and thinking yeah our, our civilization is finished now they will go into shock and you know it's all time for poetry and kumbaya but from my point of view <laughs> I've always hated civilization I've been a technologist my whole life but only because I have a fascination with understanding it I absolutely loathe technology that's, that's something that people have always struggled to understand with me because they think you know oh you're a technophile and saying no I'm a technophobic I will you know I look at technology because it's the enemy it's like no your enemy so so yeah so I was thinking this is a great message you know civilization is going to end now it's going to end dramatically and there's going to be a big dieback of the population but the way I saw it is it's a kind of you can't fail not only with a lot of people like me that you know can see each other across a crowded room and are starting to synchronize their message and you know it's bound to get out I kind of thought in terms of a religious thing in terms of a kind of manifest destiny that I thought it would all work out so it's going to be very very narrow a very close run thing it could go either way the species could go extinct but what I thought was more likely was people would react in time and we would get this golden scenario which would basically a kind of a heaven on earth I kind of imagined yeah the lions and the tigers and the polar bears they're all gonna die out all predators great white sharks they're gone but I imagined us arriving in this place where it would be kind of a, a garden of Eden it would be kind of everybody would be philosopher gardeners after you've had a die off of you know seven and a half billion people uh, that will make a philosopher out of you and I thought you know it's not a question of people being reactionary if people are reactionary it'll happen too late so in other words if they wait for the pain it's too late I mean the temperature rise from CO2 lags by about 10 years so if you if you wait for all the repercussions of climate change you you're gonna be too late but I thought that the, we're conscious enough as a species that there are enough elements within us uh, would, would waken and we would be able to pull an ace out of our sleeve and a select healthy minded few would survive and then kind of like Douglas Adams thing you'd, you'd put all the psychopaths and PhDs and all of those types and just stick them on a spaceship and send them out into space or just shoot them through the fucking head or some, whatever but anyway those guys wouldn't wouldn't survive that kind of catastrophe they'd be eaten uh, so I was celebrating it because I thought this is this is a predestiny it's kind of a teleology that this is how yeah, I, it was kind of I thought of it in terms of a kind of a phase change in consciousness and then the few people that survive you know are in heaven and long ago I wrote I've written a lot of books to myself that I never bothered to get published and uh, one of the half finished books I got was it was called heaven is a place you walk to and it was really promoting this idea that you you know that there's a path and you can you can just walk you know to heaven uh, and you can walk to hell just by sticking with civilization and going down in flames with it so kind of you know the people that stick with nature and head back to nature and you know get sane would win out and eventually the mad people would die off they would kill each other off that's kind of my thinking um, and so yeah I was thrilled I've been the most positive person known to man in the face of, a, of my first ego epiphany uh, so because I realized it's it takes people that can see that the house is on fire to precipitate this phase change it's like it needs some yeast it's not I could see clearly it wasn't going to get there on its own it's almost like you have to drop some yeast into the the mix and to make it rise into bread otherwise it'll be a, a flop and so basically I'm thinking of people like me and all the thousands of others like me are people like the yeast that's going to make this thing uh, gel so also in terms of just think of the timelines I'm thinking of this in terms of my kids uh, in the in their uh, late teens so you know I'm never going to get to see utopia but I will see the beginnings of it and I will I 
you know, as an individual, I might have a slight impact on steering it towards the condition where we have an ace to pull out our sleeves and, you know, we, we win out against the devil who's just going to, you know, civilization. Uh, so I thought with a number of people just nudging, uh, we, w we would make it. I was so sure of that, that, that I kind of was in the same position as the guys in Apollo 13. I just couldn't really foresee the, the negative side as coming true. It just didn't seem, you know, by sheer effort of willpower, people's collective consciousness will flip the dice. And so that led me to, you know, where, where I was going to go with uh, is pro propagating my message. So I thought of various ways of doing it. So for a long time, I've thought that you can only really communicate to somebody something when they have a question. So the art of didactism and, and really communicating with people is to raise a question. I've thought that for, that's been my theory on education for a long time, is that you can only really communicate with somebody when they have a question. So the art is to raise a question in their mind. So you do something like P.T. Barnum was an expert at this. He would have all these methods of like making people go, huh? And as soon as they go, huh? And ask, what are you doing? Then bam, you can get something in. If you do it really well, you can get something in and have a follow on question. So I've always thought when people give lectures and stuff, they always do it the wrong way around. They give this long, boring lecture and then they take questions at the end. Always, it should be the opposite. You should just, if you're an expert, you have whatever the lectures about you come in you sit down in an armchair and everybody just sits there quietly until somebody has a question like why is your tie red and then you go oh because blah -de blah and then somebody goes huh that doesn't make any sense blah -de blah and, and then if you're a good lecturer you should be able to lead the conversation into completing your entire message i give you an entire lesson um, but it would be completely memorable to most of the audience's dying day because they'd done it by asking questions and you'd basically done a sort of Socratic thing where you steer the questions and um, yeah that's I think that's pretty much the Socratic method so it seems inefficient but it's highly efficient you can get a lot more information in and have uh, the retention last a lot longer in that format so I thought well how do you get people to ask a question on a broad scale and I came on uh, on this uh, this format. I've gradually crept towards these uh, ideas, sort of P.T. Barnum ideas. You make a game. You you know all of this kind of you know kind of performance art thing. Uh, it's it's like theatre. You 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 get people to ask, what the hell is all that about? And that's kind of a victory. So. I stumbled upon uh, alternate reality games. So alternative, alternate reality games are something which some advertisers know about, but they haven't been used very extensively. And I realized they're an absolute gold mine, especially for this kind of thing, which is really activism and agitprop. Is an alternative reality game is very hard to understand, and it's deliberately meant to be hard to understand. There's something at, in the essence of an, an ARG, or alternative reality game, I call it an ARG, A-R-G. So there's something in it called TINAG, T-I-N-A-G, is this is not a game. That's an important element of, um, of an ARG, is that nobody can guess the game or where it's headed. So in my case, the game is headed towards saying, guys, the world is on fire climate change is serious, it's imminent, and it's not something like the IPCC is saying and, you know, in 2100 and all that kind of stuff. So not only can you use an ARG for that, it's often been speculated that an ARG is, is it's really something online, it spills into real life, and they, it's almost like a cult that sucks people in and then sucks them into the game and their game takes over their whole life until eventually you can you know use them without them even knowing it as as really guerrillas and activists in a revolution uh, so very very powerful um, could be used positively or negatively but hasn't really been exploited um, so my epiphany moment uh, for thinking that yeah an arg is the way to do it was when I saw this 
movie uh, called The Institute. And The Institute is well worth watching if you're interested in anything I've been talking about. So The Institute was a typical ARG. Uh, just just to give you more flavor of, of an arg is the, the the kind of thing is trailheads that suck you in are normally in the real world or online and the game is half online half in the real world um, but imagine you kind of see a, a poster up in san francisco and it said lost cat and then uh, you know you'd have a bengal tiger in the picture and phone numbers and heaven help you if you phone one of those phone numbers you'd be sucked down the rabbit hole so an important element of an ARG is that it has a puppet master that directs all of this. So I was thinking, yeah, I'd be a puppet master and I'd do this ARG. The kind of time scales I was thinking of was for the rest of my life. I'm, you know, in my 50s. My dad lived till 90. He had a really cush life. So I thought I could make it until maybe 70. So maybe in 20 years, the rest of my life, I could spend just waking people up with this game where nobody could figure out what it was and while they couldn't figure it out and they were trying to process where I was going and stuff, I could, you know, put all these subliminal messages in, pump them in. And so then eventually they'd have an epiphany and then they could join me in the game and we could propagate it. So that, that was my thinking. I thought I had oceans of time. I thought I had the rest of my life. And the uh, going back to the moment of epiphany then with the... Um, the movie the institute now the institute it's very hard to tell what the background is because like an arg a good arg you can't really tell it's it's ostensibly a, a documentary about an arg but because it's an arg you're not really sure if the arg is not the documentary and the whole premise behind it is bullshit uh, and so the, there was never an arg that they're documenting the arg is the documentary so you never can be sure with all of these things. Um, I researched a bit about the makers of the Institute, the movie. And as far as I can tell, it was a bit of performance art. So I think this one particular guy, I can't remember his name, but he raised about $11,000 for this bit of $11,000 for this bit of performance art. And he made this uh, movie, The Institute. So. I stole a lot of the st things out of it for my ARG. Um, the Institute, I called the Sirius Institute, and there were uh, really two places in it called, there's this really this kind of a, kind of a Shangri-La in it called Elsewhere, they're called Elsewhere. And so I took that blatantly as Elsewhere and Nowhere, those are the two destinies that you can get to, which are basically metaphors for where the planet is, you know, planet Earth is. and. Then um, I watched this movie and there were really two key things that came out of it. The key point in the movie, if you actually watch it, you'll, you'll be able to see it, is, is they interview this girl who got caught up in the, in the arg and the whole story behind, behind it. And they said, you know, they asked her what, what, what it's kind of what it's like and she Sta she's there in San Francisco in a park on a park bench and she says you know I know there's no place like elsewhere I know that it's all fake and it's all um, you know kind of just a game but it doesn't matter I mean I just I just wish I just wish there was a place like elsewhere and she bursts into tears and for me that was Kind of like the producers that's like bialystok and bloom and i'm, I'm like looking <laughs> i've been looking for my hitler and you see the worst hitler you've ever seen in your life and they go that's our hitler and i had that's our hitler moment because i realized how many as an advertiser say or somebody pushing a message how many people do you know that you can get that will burst into tears just talking about your product so i realized that this is is more than dynamite it's fucking nuclear uh, and so I decided to launch my own ARG. I, I spent about five, the last five years doing it. One of the things I realized, um, the producers of the Institute movie that did this kind of performance art thing, one of the things I realized was they got that 11,000 and they blew through it. And I realized, why? This thing could generate money. I thought, you know, it could be self-sustaining. You could grow it organically. Uh, I thought this is it. 
this is how I will get the message out. Um, so I thought, uh, yeah, Bitcoin, I mean, I hated Bitcoin. I, I knew from my background and a few other things in my past that that uh, Bitcoin's just an NSA sting operation. It's, it's not what everybody thinks. So I thought I'd do a complete anti-Bitcoin. So I did wherever, say, Bitcoin is decentralized, I'd make it centralized. Whatever, you know, whatever the blockchain thing was, then I would do the opposite. And I made this currency called Geodo, and it's out there still and not used. It never got to the point where I could launch it and use it, but I did that one first, thinking that we'd run this all with a currency, a fake currency, which you know also has real value, so it could really sustain the ARG and be grow it organically. So, um, yeah, I did. I did that. I finished that uh, the Geodo. Uh, then I wanted to do two websites, so a white hat protagonist and a black hat protagonist. I did the black hat protagonist, which is the Sirius Institute, and uh, the website. I did the website, and that character, Lord Hugh Dumba, uh, that's me. Um, and then I, you know, would have um, the Neocortex Foundation and uh, Dr. Neo Von Cortex. Kind of joke thing, but also kind of serious and always keeping people guessing. Is this a cult? Is this a recruitment thing for the NSA? Is this an advertising thing? You never keep everybody guessing, keep everybody guessing while you move it along. And then also a, a news website, you know, a fake news website called the, the Happy Puff Post. So I thought with those four websites, I could run this ARG. And so I got into the the first one I completed, the Geodo one, then I got into the Sirius Institute, and then I was made, I thought I'd promote it with these videos. So I made videos throughout last year, all the way up until December. Um, and then it was the right place to do it. I, I kind of found a loophole in, in the U, US law where you could actually have a non-violent violent revolution. They kind of locked you out everywhere so you have to have a violent revolution and that's their forte so they'll crush you if you go violent but they kind of left a kind of loophole in uh, basically internet de democracy and so I made the video I made all the run up to that and made the video you know escape um, the American Spring you know escape fake democracy that's uh, that video thing was episode five or six but the uh, yeah, I got to that, and I thought that's a correct place to stop um, and start promoting it. So I went out on social media for the first time since 1997. I had one encounter with social media in 1997, and it was in chat rooms. I went on, went into the chat room, and thought, "Oh, this is great! You know, you can connect the world and talk to people in different places and get different perspectives and." hear what foreigners think about us and wow this is the most awesome thing possible so I went into my first chat room and I connected with the first person uh, and I said you know hey can you tell me how things work around here this is the first time I've been on a chat room and I was absolutely amazed at the responses the guy came back and said fuck off I don't talk to noobs and I went <laughs> whoa <laughs> okay that took me by surprise and that inoculated me completely against social media because what I realized is it's just a prison yard I realized straight away it's a prison yard they're exploiting everybody commercially so I told other people to stay away from this shit it's it's for keeps they're going to use this data um, they're going to mine it uh, it's just for advertising and um, you know one day you're going to regret stuff you put out there and of course nobody listened to me as usual uh, and then yeah, so but I held my nose and I got back into social media in December because just to promote these videos. And I went to, I asked my kids what I should go to. I thought maybe 4chan and stuff was kind of the speed of an arg. Um, my kids told me, nah, don't do that. It's all going to pieces. And I went and checked, and it is. And um, they said, go to Reddit. So I went to Reddit, and the subreddit I went to is what I considered home territory for me, and that's anarchism. So I went on there and poked around trying to get people's interest in, um, in this video, which is, you know, I don't come out and say it's anarchic, but if, if you're anarchic, you know that it's an anarchic video. It's basically a summary of anarchy hidden in it. 
Uh, if you don't know what anarchy is, you'd think, yeah, it's you know kind of weird. Um, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you would get the anarchic message without knowing that it's you know stuff you could just about go to jail for. So, so um, yeah. Oh, um, by the way, talking about accountability. Um, an ARG is, is great from accountability because if you ever wind up in prison for running a revolution, well, you know, you basically say, but guys, it was a game. It's performance art. Don't you have a sense of humor? It's very hard for a jury to get around that kind of plausible deniability. So I thought from an ARG is so perfect in so many ways. And I didn't realize that, you know, anarchists wouldn't see it that way. I got very negative responses and the kind of responses were things like man the liberalism oh it's killing me oh you know like wearing a anonymous mask and oh, you know this is pathetic and you know and I started to realize that I was out of touch in so many ways um, I was out of touch with with anarchists which really threw me but anarchists had you know the 60s style anarchists that all decamped that all given up um, and said, you know, we're all kind of screwed. They're all nihilistic. So people of roughly my generation and older were nihilistic and had bowed out. The newer generation was hopeless, absolutely hopeless. I suddenly realized that they, you know, people would say, you know, oh yeah, but it's okay for you, rich white guy. Uh, you know, what about, you know, you're not thinking of, you know, gender issues and people of color and LGBTM and stuff. And it's like, guys, we are way, way beyond your precious little identity. It's, it's serious shit. The house is on fire. It's like, oh, yeah, well, our house is a moha. If you were black, you would know that my house is more on fire than you and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, guys, for fuck's sake, man, this is serious shit. Get over yourselves. We need to rally. This is, you know, the time. And, be, and then really serious anarchists and thoughtful ones would say yeah but we have to take it slowly and you know over the decades we'll educate people and it's like and I started to get the sense of real doom because these are my homies right I didn't realize that they were so far away from the revolution that you know I, I kind of thought I'd go on to Reddit and talk to these people. I thought I was talking to Proudhon and like Emma Goldman and you know, th you know, and I was going to tell them, hey, I've got this new idea for how to fight a revolution, and I thought they'd be thrilled. I never thought they'd be like, yeah, but that's not my kind of revolution. That's too liberal for me. You know, I want stylized re revolution. I, I realized that everybody had become such an individualist that it got through even to the anarchist community which are not supposed to be that way it's we're anti-individualism and and that kind of individualism so i realized with some horror and this was my my final dark let's call it eco epiphany was i realized we weren't going to make it because it's a psychological problem it's been a psychological problem since 2013 and I realized that no one was going to be able to react in time, in the time left. Uh, if this is the state of affairs, we were screwed. So there's a, to explain a bit more why and why it was such a moment of doom and why the sky was lowering on me every day is, um, is to see Adam Curtis. So Adam Curtis was, um, made this documentary called Century of the Self, about the 20th century, and particularly about Eddie Bernays, uh, who's, um, I think, a first cousin of, uh, or nephew. Yeah, his uncle is, uh, is Sigmund Freud. He took Sigmund Freud's idea, and he shaped the 20, 20th century. Um, undercover, nobody really knows that he did it, but he, the reason why you are the person you are today is because of Eddie Bernays. And by that I mean, you know, you're an individual and important like everybody else. And, you know, you have lifestyle choices and you're a consumer and a valued consumer and your vote counts and all this horseshit that's an absolute lie. It doesn't count for peens. But the reason why you think like that is because of Eddie Bernays. He he set this up after the war, although he used wartime propaganda from the First World War, rolled over to the Second World War, and the establishment was really, really worried. 
after World War II, about controlling the masses of people and the, you know, the population was set to explode. And they really thought that this was a crisis. So a crisis of management. So they, Eddie Bernays explained to them how to do crowd management. And the first thing was to basically atomize people. So you get rid of all the syndicates, you get rid of all the, um, all the unions, any, you get rid of the family, you get ri rid of, uh, or have a nuclear family, which just fits nicely into the hierarchy. But you've got to get rid of tribalism. You've got to, you know, use all these trigger words to get rid of tribalism. And uh, they did it systematically and if you're interested in that you should see Adam Curtis's uh, movie Century of the South and essentially what it is you make everybody selfish you, and that atomizes them they're all selfish atomized consumers really Adam Smith's uh, dream wet dream nightmare so they were incredibly successful so successful that they'd got anarchists and then you can go in there and say like people you know they wanted to have a, yeah, they, they wanted the anarchist revolution tailored to be like how they wanted. And they wanted a gilt edge, you know, invitation to go. And it had to have, you know, conf confrontation on the streets with police and stuff. Otherwise, it wasn't a real... Uh, and it's all this kind of self-defeating bullshit. And I started to realize, if I can't get anarchists to see that I've just handed them basically the keys to basically the gates of the castle, we really are screwed. And so it was a hard blow uh, to realize that there's no way people are going to wake up in time. So I, it really threw me. I mean, it, I haven't recovered since. I'm still in a very fragile condition. But I, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure what to, to do and where to go after that. But I spent January after I had this revelation, kind of like over the New Year period. I kind of thought, well, my whole life plan has been tossed. My, all my prepping and everything that I'd set myself up to do, it was all gone in a kind of a flash. And I spent January going over, making sure I was absolutely sure of my facts. And as I went over them, it just got worse and worse. And I realized, if anything, I was... I was ludicrously optimistic in my pessimistic evaluation by 2013. There's so many tipping points that have run away. And then, yeah, eventually I got around to the McPherson paradox, which I kind of knew about global dimming, but it just didn't register, uh, like all these things. And, yeah, when it finally registered, I realized, you know, I'd, I'd always assumed that it was a matter of a psychological thing. You're getting people to turn around step on the brakes and we'll we'll it'll be close but we will wind up just teetering over the brink the vehicle won't go over the cliff um, then I realized no we really are going over the cliff there's no way and then by the time I got into realizing you know re reconnecting making that connection two separate frames global dimming global warming I made that connection was just never made it before and realized okay so even if we stepped on the brakes we're doomed so yeah then I started making these videos just kind of thought I can't kind of tail off right then I need to explain my story and then since then I've been increasingly start to, starting to realize that there is another thing to fight for and it is still kind of the game is still kind of on and the, the way is that it's kind of like my original thing that heaven is a place you you walk to and that's there is a very dark nowhere place i call nowhere in my arg in the serious institute and the, the planet elsewhere there still is that you can have a very 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 bleak dark apocalypse and that's where we're headed and that's a managed apocalypse and then you know you still have this breakaway where enlightened people um really take control it's not for free um can't be done without violence but a, I'll, I'll explain the story more and anyway that's my eco epiphany and I look forward to hearing yours and particularly for people out there is you're not alone you're not alone that millions of people are living what you're living now and it's important that we we all connect so I've I haven't really connected with people around me on this earth because they're not 
the, you know, just various stages of denial. What I realized in December was it's not a question of running down to the people that are picking up fish when the seas receded and they don't realize the tsunami was coming in. I thought it was just a question of waking people up and I was wrong. I was being very, very naive all these years. Um, it's, it's what I realized what people are doing was they're going like this and they're going, shut up. I know, I know it's bad. Just fuck off, fuck off. I don't want to know. Fuck off. And they, you know, head down. And so, so they, they're not, it's not a question of waking them up. They have their head in the sand and, and violently in the sand. They, they will kick your ass if you try to pull their, their head out of the sand because everybody kind of knows we are screwed. They just don't want to look at it. Um, so it's not a question of waking up. It's active denial. And not only that, it's hostile, militant denial. Uh, so if you're feeling that, yeah, you just have to live with it and you need to start connecting, um, you know, with people like Big Gav and, you know, the, the Going South uh, tribe and network. So we, we need to, to connect and, um, and so we, we need to support each other. But that doesn't mean you can communicate even your spouse. I was, I failed completely to communicate this to my spouse, even my kids, my close family. Um, yeah, most of the members of my family won't watch these videos because they know exactly what's in them and they don't want to hear. So, yeah, it's, uh, there's still a long, long road to go. Um, it's not uh, imminent catastrophe uh, is almost upon us on the clock. But in terms of psychological development, it's a lifetimes. Lifetimes will be compressed into the short time we have. So again, pick your comrades carefully. And that's it. That's my story. I'm dying to hear yours.